All right, everybody, uh, you guys ready to dive into Acts today? Okay, there we go. Yeah, we're going to get into it today. That's good. Um, iPad is back working. Bless God, he is good. Uh, so we're going to be okay. We are in uh, week 34. Uh, I told First Service this, I cannot wait to stand up here and say we are in week 52 of our study through the book of Acts. We're 34 weeks in, uh, probably going to be right close to about 52 or so weeks, that's my guess. Uh, we have about 11 chapters to go. Uh, so it's going to be fun. Uh, listen, we have, we're going to cover Acts 17, verses 16 through 34. We have lots of verses to get to together, but here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to group them together so we don't miss lunch. Amen? We're going to get out of here. It's NFL kickoff Sunday, yes? So we got to be, I got to be better today. All right, here we go. So if you remember, to kind of catch us up, Paul's on his second missionary journey, as we kind of covered in Acts 16, and, and where we left off last week, remember, Paul has taken the gospel, uh, or the good news about who Jesus is, he's taken it to uh, a brand new place, a, a continent of Europe for the first time. Paul didn't want to go there, but remember, God kind of redirected his steps. Uh, Europe was, uh, or Macedonia was his third option. Right, Not his first or his second, but his third. He wanted to go uh, down towards the province of Asia, but God said no, prevented him from going there. And he finds his way going to a place where the gospel has never been preached before. And the first place he stops is a town or a city called Philippi. Now, when he goes to Philippi, uh, he meets a woman there. Do you remember her name, the woman he meets in Philippi? Lydia, yes, very good. He meets Lydia, who deals in what color cloth? Yeah, purple cloth and a very wealthy uh, businesswoman, and uh, she becomes the first convert on the continent of Europe uh, to the church, to Jesus. She believes in Jesus, and that it is a woman speaks volumes that, that Luke notes that. We, we kind of went through that in detail a few weeks ago. Uh, and so Lydia gets saved, her household, a church is planted in her house. In her house, the first Christian worship service, so to speak, took place in her house. It's amazing what happens. And then last, last week, we followed Paul from Philippi, and he finds his way down to Thessalonica. Now, that city should sound a little familiar to us as Paul wrote two letters about three months after he leaves Thessalonica, right? Can you guess what the letters are called that are written to the people that lives, lives in Thessalonica? Very good. Thessalonians. Can you guess what the letters are called? First and second Thessalonians. Very creatively titled there. Uh, but Paul writes that um, in there and uh, Paul goes and he shares the gospel in Thessalonica, and kind of the same pattern begins to emerge as Paul visits the local synagogue, as he does in every town he goes to on these missionary journeys. That's the first place he goes. Something happens that happens over and over. Paul presents the gospel. Some people believe, and they join the group of believers that are called what? Okay, what is the group of believers called? The church, yes, that wasn't a trick question. The group of believers is called the church, right? And so a lot of people join the church in that place in Thessalonica. But then we also learn this happens as Paul preaches the gospel. Some people don't believe, and they don't like the way that Paul presents things. So much so that they don't just not like him, they want to do what to him? Yeah, they want to kill him. Like this is a pattern that happens over and over in the ministry of Paul. Every synagogue he visits... People want to kill him. Now, if it were you and me, or let me just say it this way, I won't speak for you, I'll speak for me. If people wanted to kill me after every synagogue I went to, I feel it would be wisdom to not go to synagogues anymore, yes? Right, I'd probably stop going because if it's difficult and it's dangerous and it's really hard and people aren't gonna like me and they're gonna wanna kill me, I'm probably not gonna go there anymore. But Paul's kind of a different character. Paul doesn't stop, he just keeps subjecting himself to the same things over and over and over and over again. And I asked this question last week, and I want to bring it back up again, because I think it's important that we understand Paul's mentality. Why does Paul keep subjecting himself to this? Why the misery? Why the persecution? If he knows it's there, why does he willingly go through it in every town, in every synagogue with those people? Why? And I came up with a couple of responses that I think kind of fits well as I was studying last week. Um, why does Paul keep subjecting himself to this difficulty over and over again? Here's what I think. He does it because Jesus is worth it and because people matter. This is why he does it. Jesus is worth it and people matter. And church, I think if those two things drove everything that we do, 
I think we could have some major, major impacts wherever our feet are, yes? Jesus is worth it, and people matter. Even when it was hard and unfair, Paul still served Jesus and loved people, even when they did not love him back. Paul still did it anyway. For Paul, it was never about convenience. It was about commitment. And church, we need to be reminded about this, about Christianity, over and over again. Christianity is not about convenience. Christianity is about commitment. It takes commitment to follow the way of Jesus. Here's what I think. It's easy to call yourself a follower of Jesus. How many of you know it's another thing to follow him? Right, we can say we're a follower of Jesus, but to truly follow him, right? that's another level. Right? It's easy to say it. It's another thing to, to live it. Church, it's not convenient to love people the way that Jesus loves you, is it? Because let's be honest about people. People can be jerks sometimes, yes? Not you guys. You guys are perfect. But everybody else on the other side of you, right? Hard to love people, especially those who don't do the things that you want them to do or say the things that you want them to say. But I have to remind you, even though they're not easy to love, it's not an excuse to not do it. It's not about convenience. It's about commitment. And Paul, he does this work over and over and over again, even though it's difficult. Church, let me say before we kind of move forward, let's not be afraid to do the work that God has called us to. If God has called us to it, I think he expects us to work through it. That rhymed. Come on, that was good, right? That's, that's got to be of the Lord. Christianity is not about convenience, it's about commitment. So Paul subjects himself to this over and over again. Now I want you to think about the time frame here. Paul has just come to this brand new place where the gospel has never been preached before. He goes to one town, one town, to four women on a riverbank outside of the city because there was no synagogue in Philippi. One place. And he goes to Thessalonica. Listen to what they say about Paul and Silas and the people who were following Jesus. Listen to verse 6. And when they could not find them, because they wanted to drag Paul out and kill him, when they wanted to find them, Paul and Silas, they dragged Jason and some of the other believers uh, before the city authorities. Listen to what they said about people who had been into one town on a brand new continent. These men have turned the world upside down, and they have come here also. And Jason has received them, and they are acting against the decrees of Caesar, saying there is another king, Jesus. They visit one town, and the people who don't believe what they're saying say this about them. They have turned the world upside down, and it is, appears obvious they love Jesus more than anything else. That's amazing. One town and word has spread. They've turned the world upside down with all of these wild ways to live that's so different. Love your enemies. Pray for those who hurt you. It's crazy. And they're more allegiant to Jesus than anything else. They noticed. And I asked this question last week. Do people notice that you follow Jesus? Like, do they really notice? Are we living in such a way that people look at our lives and say, that person is different, and it seems like they go the opposite way that the world is going? Do people notice? People notice Paul and the believer's devotion to Jesus. And in typical Paul fashion, here's what happens next. But when the Jews in Thessalonica learned that Paul had moved down and was preaching the word of God at Berea, some of them went there too, agitating the crowds and stirring them up. So they came there to do the same thing. They wanted to kill Paul. And so verse 14, the believers immediately sent Paul to the coast. We're going to send Paul away so we can experience some peace here. Protect Paul, protect us a little bit. And they send Paul down to the coast, and he's going to go visit Athens. Verse 15, those who escorted Paul brought him to Athens and then left with instructions for Silas and Timothy to join them as soon as possible. And so Paul has been shipped out to Athens all by himself. And this is where we're picking up the text today. Paul in Athens all by himself. And can you guess what Paul's probably going to do when he gets to Athens all by himself? He's going to visit the local synagogue, and let's see what happens. Verses 16 and 17 is where we'll start. And so here's how it reads. 
While Paul was waiting for them, Silas and Timothy in Athens, these two phrases need to matter. He was greatly distressed. Park that in your mind. He was greatly distressed to see that the city was full of idols. Now, to give you kind of a word picture when it says full of idols, the Greek kind of leans towards this picture of it was submerged. So, like, there were so many idols, it felt like it was underwater with idols. That's how many idols were there. Paul was greatly distressed to see the idolatry that was going on. Verse 17, he was greatly distressed, so he reasoned. Keep that in your mind. He reasoned in the synagogue with both Jews and God-fearing Greeks, as well as in the marketplace, day by day with those who happened to be there. Now, these first two verses... Something jumped out at me that has never jumped out before as I read this passage and as I was reading it this week. And I could honestly do an entire message or two around these two verses. We're going to spend the bulk of our time in these first two verses before we get to the rest. We'll kind of lump the end in in a bunch of verses. Uh, You may not see it at first, but this speaks to something I think that can speak volumes to us where we are today in our climate and in our culture. And I think it would be very wise of us and we would do well to learn from the Apostle Paul in the first two verses here, because we live in an outrage type of culture, don't we? We live in an outrage type of culture, and Paul does something here that's very wise that we need to learn about. So verse 16 again, while Paul was waiting for them in Athens, he was, what's the next two words? Greatly distressed. He was greatly distressed to see the city was full of idols. Now, that phrase, greatly distressed, in the Greek, the term is this. It's parox uno. Everybody say parox uno. Sounds like a good card game, doesn't it? Parox uno. Here's what it means. To be irritated, to be provoked, to be aroused to anger, or to burn with anger. How many of you know from experience you have experienced that definition in your life before? Right? All of us have. Listen, when my wife comes home from work and she notices I got a haircut and she said, Pat, did you get your hair cut? And I said, no, I got all of my hairs cut. Irritated and provoked to anger (laughs) is what transpires next, okay? All of us have experienced that uh, to some level. Let me ask the question, how many of you get angry? Leave your hand up. How many of you get angry often? Put the other one up. How many of you get angry at the person next to you? Oh, you got your elbows left, right? Let's throw some elbows. No, we, we get angry, and we get angry often. And so it's what I want to do for the next few moments is talk a little bit about anger. Because the Apostle Paul teaches us something very, very wise that we need to learn here. And so when it comes to anger, here's what I want you to begin to think about. It's not so much that we get angry, but rather it's what we do with our anger that is very important. What we do with our anger is going to determine what we and others experience on the other side of us. And so here's an important question for you to consider and for me to consider today. Does anger, does my anger drive my responses? Does anger drive the way that I respond to the person on the other side of me? All right, we're going to talk about anger. Now, this is good news. It is not sin. It is not a sin to get angry. That's good news. It is not a sin to get angry. Paul was angry, right? He got angry often. Paul had reason to get angry often. We get angry often, and there's a reason for us to get angry. Anger is a natural human emotion, and what we need to learn to do is deal with it in a little bit of a more healthy way. Now, here's why we need to learn to deal with anger, because wherever there is conflict and disagreement, anger will always be present, always. How many of you deal with conflict and disagreement on a daily basis? Anger will always be present to you. So we have to learn to deal with something that is constantly around us all of the time. We need to learn to be healthier. So I have a lot to say. I just want to give you a few thoughts on anger and how to deal with it and maybe some healthier options, and then we'll move on to the rest of the text. So remember, it's not a sin to get angry. And all the angry people said amen or amen, right? You say it real mad. Uh, Not a sin to get angry, but listen, sin enters the picture When our anger begins to drive the way that we respond and behave to people on the other side of us. Let me say it this way. It's not a sin to get angry, but it is a sin to stay angry. It's a sin to stay angry, right? Paul would write this to the church uh, at Ephesus in in Ephesians chapter 4. We're actually going to cover Paul finally getting to visit Ephesus in Acts chapter 19 in a few weeks. Paul wrote this to the church at Ephesus about anger because people deal with anger wherever they are. Listen to what he says. 
He says, in your anger, do not sin, which means it's possible to not sin in your anger. And then he gives us a principle that I think tells us how we can not sin in our anger. He says, in your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry. That's the principle. He says, and do not give the devil a foothold. Here's how God's word instructs us to not sin in our anger. He says, do not let the sun go down while you are angry. In other words, I would say it this way. You've heard me say it this way before. Anger must be dealt with on the day that I am angry. It's got to be dealt with on the day that I am angry. We sin in our anger when we hold on to it for too long. Here's what I know. The time frame for humans to hang on to anger before we start sinning is not very long because we do not handle it very well. Anger works quick in our human hearts. So the only way to not sin in our anger is to get rid of it as soon as we can. If we do not deal with anger on the day that we are angry, here's what Paul says. We have left the door open for the devil to do work in our lives. He says, and do not give the devil a foothold, right? If we hang on to it, scripture tells us that I've given the devil a foothold. Here's what I know about the devil. He's never satisfied with just your foot. He wants it all. And eventually, that anger is not just going to stay inside of you. It's going to begin to touch all of the relationships that you are in. And if you hang on to it over and over and over again, it's going to begin to drive and dictate how you respond in those relationships. And anger wrecks and ruins relationships. We know this through experience. It wrecks it. Listen, for human beings, anger and time are a dangerous mixture. Anger and time are a dangerous mixture. Now, I know what some of you may be thinking, but Pat, what about that scripture in that time where Jesus got angry? And he got angry, and he did something about it. He had a righteous anger. Let me say this today with all of the love that I have. You aren't Jesus. You can't handle it. You can't. Because we cannot separate our humanity from it. It's impossible. He and I could handle it, and I, I would love to do a whole message on that. Maybe one day I will. I just don't have time today. But you aren't Jesus. And Paul very wisely says, get rid of it as soon as you can. Listen, here's what I do. Anger and time are a dangerous mixture. This is just me personally. It's easy for me to do this. When I'm angry at someone, I can internalize it and kind of push it down. Right, just based on my personality, right? I can internalize it, push it down, and kind of keep it suppressed for a little bit. But here's what I've discovered is the problem with that. When I push it down and suppress it, and I don't say something about it, here's what it does between me and the other person that I'm angry with. It creates a gap between us. A distance is created. A gap is created. And when I'm angry, and there is a gap there, what my mind puts in that gap about that other person is very negative. And then when I hang on to that anger even more and I'm putting negative things and my mind is telling me negative things that may not even be true about the other person, but the anger is driving that, the gap gets wider. And guess what goes in the extra space in that gap? More negativity, more anger, and I get bitter. And then when anger and bitterness is driving and, and it's filling that gap with all kinds of negative things, Whatever that other person does or says or even people they are connected to, I interpret what they do and what they say as an act of war against me, even though it is not. This is the danger of holding on to anger for so very long. And then another scary thing is in that gap, you begin to have imaginary conversations with yourself about what you want to say to that other person. Anybody ever have a fight in your head with someone and then you don't really have it? And it creates this negativity. And you begin to hate that person more and more and more as you build the case against them. This is what anger can do. We need to get rid of our anger because we cannot handle it rightly. And Scripture says the only way to not sin in our anger is to get rid of it. Getting rid of our anger means we're going to have to do this. It's something people don't like to do. We're going to have to confront the person. We're going to have to use kindness as we confront the person, not anger. We're going to have to use care. It's going to involve a conversation. It might involve forgiveness. But we're going to have to talk and confront the other person. If we don't deal with it, 
you and I both know it will destroy us. And it will destroy whatever bridge there was between us. When anger is in control of me, God is not. And we're going to follow a way that is not the good way that Jesus has shown us. And this is when we say things and do things that can just be detrimental to relationships. We had to deal with our anger. Are you with me? All right now, now, I want you to think about Paul. I want you to think about what you know about his personality. We did an entire message between Paul and Barnabas splitting up. We talked about both of their personalities. Paul is a type A type of personality, right? Remember towards John Mark when he thought John Mark abandoned them on their first missionary journey. Right? He was angry. Paul could be a ticking time bomb. But I think after that instance in Acts chapter 15, maybe he grows or matures a little bit. Even though he's prone to anger and he was greatly distressed, he was irritated and provoked to anger. Listen to verse 17, right? He was greatly distressed to see the city was full of idols. What was his response? Verse 17. So he reasoned with them in the synagogue, with Jews and God-fearing Greeks, as well as in the marketplace, day by day with those who happened to be there. He was provoked to anger. He was irritated. But how does he, how does he respond? Listen, Paul doesn't react in his anger. He responds with reason. He responds with reason. The Greek word for the word reasoned with, it's the word dialegami. Everybody say dialegami. Yeah, very, very good, right? Same word we talked about last week. It means this. It means to have a dialogue, to have conversation, to discuss with the other person. Same as we talked about last week. Paul was angry and aroused to anger, and he burned with anger, and he was irritated. And what was his response? He had a conversation. They had questions and answers. They took the time to look eye to eye with one another and talk. He was calm and he acted with care. Think about it. If he had responded only with anger, do you think they would have really received what he was wanting to say? No way, right? Paul doesn't launch from anger. Paul launches from love. He launches from care. Paul knows this, and if you don't get anything from today, please listen. Whatever it is that you think anger and outrage will accomplish, I promise you, love will do a better job. It will always do a better job. Whatever it is you think anger and outrage will accomplish, love will do a better job. Church, Jesus is worth it, and people matter. This is why Paul responds the way that he does. Don't react in anger, respond with reason, right? Paul writes this in Romans 12, 18. This is the goal. If it is possible, as far as it depends on who, there is no them in this verse. Peace doesn't start with the other person, does it? It starts with us. As far as it depends on you, live at peace with everything, with everyone. And Pat, you may say, well, that's really hard. To which I will say, Christianity is not about convenience. It is about commitment to follow the way of Jesus. Paul responds with reason instead of anger. And here's what happens. Doors begin to open that would not have opened had he just been angry. Listen to verse 18 to the doors that open. A group of Epicurean and Stoic philosophers begin to debate with him. Some of them asked, what is this babbler trying to say? How many of you that would have made you mad? That would have made me mad too. All right, what is this babbler trying to say? Paul doesn't get mad. Others remarked, he seems to be advocating foreign gods, for they said Paul was preaching the good news about Jesus and the resurrection. These doors open to these philosophies, these philosophers who think differently than Paul does. Let me just in a nutshell, very quickly, uh, I won't do it justice, but I'll give you an idea of it. Epicurean philosophy basically says this, that pleasure and happiness are the chief goals in life. Whatever's going to make you feel good, doesn't matter what it does to anybody else, you just do it, do you, whatever makes you happy, that's fine. Pleasure is the end goal. Stoic philosophy says this, it puts a great emphasis on moral sincerity and a high sense of duty. Basically, it's this, you stay within yourself, you look to yourself, you keep the rules. If life gets difficult, stiff up your lip, pull up your bootstraps, keep going, look within, all right? So you have one group that says, find life through pleasure. Another that says you find life through your self-righteousness, right? Keeping the rules. Well, let me say this. Pleasure and self-righteousness. Not much has changed from the first century to our century today. It's the same kinds of things. This is what Paul is dealing with, right? 
Paul, rather than getting mad at what he saw, has a conversation with people who are completely different than him, hold completely different philosophies and ideologies than he does. They worship many gods represented by many idols that makes Paul angry. But Paul doesn't respond out of anger. He does something brilliant. Listen to what happens next. Then they took him, another open door because he doesn't respond in anger. They took him and brought him to a meeting of the Areopagus. Now, the Areopagus was, it was the center of culture for Athens. Everybody who was everybody was a part of the Areopagus. Magistrates, ex-magistrates, they would hold court, make rulings, talk about new ideas, philosophies. Everything happened here. Paul finds his way to the center of culture in Athens because he doesn't respond in anger, he responds with reason. And then it goes on to say, uh, they took him and brought him before the Areopagus and they said, may we know what this new teaching is that you are representing. He gets an open door. You are bringing some strange ideas to our ears and we would like to know what they mean. Now, verse 21 is funny to me because it is a parenthetical aside that Luke writes as he's writing this down. And here's what he does. He gives us his opinion on these Athenians. And listen to what he says. This just makes me laugh. He says, all the Athenians and foreigners who live there spent their time, I love this phrasing, doing nothing but talking. <laughs> Isn't that so good? They do nothing but talk all of the time, right? I love Luke's uh, idea there. That's funny. Verse 20, again, you're bringing some strange ideas. We would like to hear more. So Paul stood up in the meeting of the Areopagus, and listen to what he says. People of Athens, I see that you in every way are very religious. Paul compliments them. Over something that makes him angry, Paul compliments them. I see you're very religious, for as I walked around and looked carefully at your objects of worship, I even found an altar with this inscription, to an unknown God. So the thing that you are ignorant of is the very thing that I'm going to proclaim to you. So you've got to remember, Paul is angry and distressed and provoked over what he sees in the city with its idolatry. Right? Paul knows the better way. He knows Jesus. He knows where life to the full can be found. But to communicate his message effectively, he cannot work from anger. And this is what he does. Paul brilliantly, between people who fundamentally disagree and believe differently than he does, you know what Paul does? Listen, Paul finds common ground with them. Paul finds common ground. It's incredible. Listen, finding common ground levels the ground before the two people. And it allows you to look eye to eye with the person. And you can have a real conversation. Listen, finding common ground is a work of compassion from one person to another. Why is it so important? Here's why. Because common ground is a fertile soil that can yield much growth and productivity. Jesus found common ground as he used parables. And he used everyday things around him to have conversations with people. Paul found common ground because he knows, if I can look eye to eye with somebody we can get some things accomplished. But if all we are is looking down our noses at one another, we're not going to hear what each other are saying. Do you know why Republicans and Democrats cannot have respectful conversations with one another? That's not an opening line to a joke. That's a real question. <laughs> Do you know why Republicans and Democrats cannot have a respectful common, ground, uh, com a common discussion with one another? It's because they don't start on common ground. Both sides have a common ground, believe it or not. Both of them love the country and want it to get better. The other side doesn't believe that, but that is the common ground between the two. But they never start with common ground. They only start with their differences. And when you start with differences, right, what's going to happen? You're going to get angry at one another, it's going to escalate, and you'll never have a real conversation or get anything accomplished, right? That's politics in the modern day. doesn't get anything accomplished. And the church shouted, Amen. Because they don't start on common ground. It escalates and both sides begin to hate one another. That's no way to get anything done. Let me ask this question. Do you re really want to have a conversation with someone who doesn't want to hear you and thinks they're better than you? No way, right? Why would we do that with people on the other side of us? Work hard to find common ground. This is what Paul does. And what's wild is, is the common ground that Paul finds is he compliments them on how religious they are. It's crazy. The thing that irritates Paul the most was the thing he compliments them on as he's talking. 
I see that you're very religious with all of these idols. You guys are really good at worshiping is basically what Paul is saying. You're really good at it. You're good worshipers. And if I had to put a definition on worship, I, I would just say this. It's not Christian. I'll make it that way in just a moment. But this would be my definition of worship. Worship happens when we determine something is valuable and of worth, and then we give ourselves to it. Right? That's worship. And according to that definition, all of us are worshipers, aren't we? We find things that are valuable to us and we deem worthy, and we give ourselves to it. For example, if you've ever been to a concert... You've seen worship. My daughter's gone to a Taylor Swift concert. I've accompanied her to a Harry Styles concert. My goodness, I've seen worship before, right? If you've ever been to a college football game, well, except for last night, right? You've seen worship, but sorry, I couldn't resist. You've seen worship there. If you've ever had a boyfriend or a girlfriend, you've seen worship. If you've ever hung a poster in your room when you were 10 or 11 or 12 years old, of Alyssa Milano when she was in Who's the Boss? Right? Come on, I'm speaking to the older people now. Or maybe if you ever had the Tiger Beat poster of Jonathan Taylor Thomas from Home Improvement. Easy, ladies, easy. Right? We've seen worship. We understand. Listen, every single one of us in this room, and I think Paul would agree, we're good at worship. Paul recognized it with the Athenians. They were great at worship. And I'm not here today to try to get you to be a better worshiper. You want to know why? You're already very talented at it. You're already a good worshiper. Right? Why? Because God created humanity to worship. And if we don't worship God, what will we do? We'll turn and worship and give ourselves to something else. I can't teach you to be better because you are already insanely amazing at worship. And so the issue I think Paul is getting at is this one. Listen, the goal isn't to get the quality of your worship to improve. The goal is to get the object of your worship to improve. This is what Paul is getting at with the Athenians, and I think it's what we need to hear today. We're good at giving ourselves to things that we deem worthy. The quality is fine, but just like the Athenians, we give ourselves and our time to little bitty G-O-D-S's as opposed to big G-O-D God. We give so much to everything else. And church, don't we give so little to Jesus? It ought not to be. And so let me ask this question today that I think Paul was posing to the Athenians. Does the object of my worship need to change? That's the question to consider. Does the object of my worship need to change? And then Paul says, you're great at worship. And I noticed an altar to an unknown God. It was one of those, in case we missed it with all these other ones that aren't real, we'll make an altar to an unknown God just in case, right? Just in case we missed it, we've got this one on the side, right? Just in case we missed it this week, we'll show up to church a few times on a Sunday just so maybe we can find it, right? Just like the Athenians, listen, the problem is we don't believe in God. The problem is we have some idols on the side that get more time. That's the issue here, right? And those idols begin to overshadow God when we give more of our time to them. It's not that they're greater than God. They have no power other than that which we give it to them, right? That's the only reason idols become greater is because we make them so in our lives. And here's what I know. False gods give false hope. And Paul would say we need to turn back to the one true God. Paul says, this unknown God is the God I'll make known to you. Now I'm going to read the rest of the verses for today, and we'll be closing up. Verse 24, thinking of, listen, think about the Epicurean and the Stoic philosophies. Think about what Paul has said with your great worshipers, and then he begins to kind of lower the boom a little bit. He says, the God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth, and he does not live in temples built by human hands, and he is not served by human hands as if he needed anything. Rather, he himself gives everyone life and breath and everything else. From one man he made all the nations that they should inhabit the whole earth. And he marked out their appointed times and histories and the boundaries of their lands. God did this so they would seek him and perhaps reach out and find him, though he is not too far from any of us. Then he quotes some of their local poets. 
much in the way I quote sometimes local musical artists here, right? I'm just copying the Apostle Paul. He says, for in him we live and move and have our being, as some of your own poets have said. We are his offspring. Paul's finding common ground. And he says, therefore, since we are God's offspring, we should not think that the divine is being like gold or silver or stone or an image made by human design and skill. God cannot be contained and confined in idols. And he says, in the past, God overlooked such ignorance, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent. For he has set a day when he will judge the world with justice by the man. And then he introduces Jesus here, right? That he has appointed and he has given proof of this to everyone by raising him from the dead. And when they heard about the resurrection of the dead, some of them sneered, but others said, we want to hear you again on this subject. Because of the way Paul talked, more open doors. At that, Paul left the council, and some of the people became followers of Paul and believed. Among them was Dionysius, a member of the Areopagus, a woman named Damaris, and a number of others. Paul is clear. God has created everything. And if we are giving more worship to created things as opposed to the Creator, what is his advice to us? Repent. A change of mind with a change of direction. This is what he calls us to. Listen, you can come back, Haley, wherever you are. In each of our lives, in each of our lives, there is a place that worship leads to. Listen, worship leaves a trail to the throne of our lives. And on the throne of our lives, at the end of our trail of worship, there sits something at the center of who we are. There sits something that we worship. And let me ask you this question. At the end of that trail of worship, at the center of who you are, let me just ask you to consider, what's there? What's at the center of who you are? Is it Jesus or is it yourself? What are we serving and giving ourselves to? Is it Jesus or is it self? And if we determine that the object of our worship needs to change, church, today's a good day to repent. That's not a mean word. That's just a word that's encouraging us to have a change of mind and a change of direction. And today, if you recognize that the object of your worship needs to change, make the change today. Make the change. Take a step towards Jesus. Trust him. Invite him into your life. Follow him. Trusting Jesus looks like following him wherever your feet are. That's how you trust him. You take a step towards him. So if the object needs to change, change today. If anger is eating you up inside, please listen. There is a better way. There's freedom from that. It's found in following the way of Jesus. Deal with your anger as opposed to let it keep oppressing you. Take a step towards him today. A change of mind and a change of direction.